via telephone, Delegate Paul Espinosa, Speaker Pro Tem, and candidate for the state Senate as well. Paul, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Maria. Good morning, Bill. Good to be with you this morning. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Let me just state that in your voice, along with Michael Height, I think I've found the two healthy people located in the Capitol <laughs> this time of the year. Paul, you sound like you're doing well. Well, I'm, I'm doing well. Um, uh, actually, I uh, feel like maybe coming down with just a little bit of a cold, but uh, uh. we'll definitely fight through it. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, this warm weather, uh, we're, I think we're expecting temperatures here in the Kanawha Valley. Uh, 61 degrees, I think, is what I saw the forecast. So uh, uh, hopefully the warm weather will chase some of these uh, germs away and uh, and uh, can fight through it. Yeah, well, I'm sorry if I actually put the jinx on you there by saying that you were healthy. Now you're saying you're coming down with something there. Uh, oh, oh, we'll manage. Hey, I wanted to ask you first because you sent me a, a, a good text on this when we were discussing it uh, earlier, and that has to do with the uh, the, the state party possibly – uh, passing uh, a new rule that would permit, or, sorry, would prohibit independents from voting in the Republican primary. And uh, there was some, I guess, confusion that I think I thought this was being delayed until 26. And then you sent me a text that said it would actually kick in in time for 25. Can you tell me what's going on with that? Well, that's my understanding. And again, it's uh, uh, not something that I've followed extremely closely, but uh, one thing that uh, uh, I thought it was important to point out to you when you all were discussing it the other day is that what, what's being proposed, as I understand it, is to actually have that change take effect this election cycle. So we're talking about this May uh, under the proposal that apparently is uh, uh, coming from the resolutions committee uh, on a fairly tight vote. Uh, that would actually close the primary this May. and. To, to be clear, Rob, I mean, I, I think it's something, uh, it's an issue that's certainly worthy of discussion, uh, you know, but I think it's important to carefully weigh the uh, the impacts and, uh, uh, in any case, uh, just uh, make sure it's done in a way that uh, you can provide voters adequate notice. Uh, I mean, here, here again, you know, uh, you... Uh, Understandably, uh, we're under the impression that perhaps this was going to take effect sometime later. And I think the thing that uh, I think would be very unfortunate is if uh, unaffiliated voters who, uh, frankly, have helped uh, Republicans uh, achieve the majorities that we have uh, here in recent years, if they show up to the polls in May thinking that they can support Republican candidates uh, only to be told that, no, uh, you're not eligible to vote in the primary. I I'm just uh, concerned that trying to rush this through so quickly this year uh, would, in effect, uh, disenfranchise uh, a number of voters. Paul, uh, it's my, my understanding that the full committee will vote <laughs> on this and uh, this coming Saturday. Up until they actually vote, everything is kind of speculation. But uh, this coming Saturday, we should know, should we not? That's my understanding. I, uh, uh, as I understand it, they were scheduled to meet last week, but yes. with the weather and so forth, they postponed it to this weekend. So hopefully we'll get some clarity. Uh, Delegate Hardy, who I think might have shared this on your program, he uh, – he asked the Secretary of State's office uh, when they appeared before the House Finance Committee for their budget hearing whether in the event that the uh, Republican, the state Republican Executive Committee opted to close our primary, whether the Secretary of State's office had uh, adequate funds in order to help get the word out. And the, the, the short answer was no, that uh, this is not something that they had really budgeted for. And again, I think, you know, I, I think it's a topic that's worthy of consideration. You know, you perhaps, uh, you know, if, if there's agreement that this uh, is the way to go, uh, I think, uh, you know, with the next election cycle, the 26th election cycle would, would certainly make more sense than the uh, – uh, implement it this close to the election when, frankly, we're almost at the end of candidate fallings. And so that's my really concern. I just hate to see folks that have been very supportive of me and other Republican candidates uh, get to the polls and, and basically be told that they can't vote for the candidates they had planned to support. And so, for clarification, very quick, Marie, for clarification, this is a party decision and not a state, uh, state or legislative decision. It's a party decision. You're exactly right, yeah. Bill. And so then, Paul, what Jackie Long asks um, on our feed, what's the reason for not allowing unaffiliated voters um, to vote in the, in, in the Republican primary? 
Do you have a sense of that or? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's probably best asked uh, for some of those folks that propose this uh, uh. this this change. Uh, it's my understanding, uh, Maria, that this was considered by the state the Republican Executive Committee, I believe this last year, perhaps this last summer. Uh, and it, uh, my understanding is that it was soundly defeated. Uh, and so, again, it's just a little perplexing why it's coming up uh, here you know, this late in the game. So, uh, again, don't have a really good sense. Uh, it, it, it kind of does have the feel of some folks perhaps trying to change the rules in the middle of the game, perhaps for for some benefit to, to uh, candidates. But uh, again, I think the I think the real loser could potentially be uh, those unaffiliated voters who have just uh, been accustomed to being able to choose either a Republican or a Democratic mm-hmm. ballot and uh, showing up only to to learn that no, you, you cannot uh, participate in the Republican primary. And I just got this text, which just goes to show in our audience, there's always somebody who knows and has insider information. This one was from Summer Barrett. She's on the GOP Resolutions Committee. And she says in her text, I tried to amend to 2026 and lost. I voted no on the committee and will vote no again on Saturday. The same attempt was made last summer. It was defeated by the committee 80 to 20. But I think the vote will be far closer uh, this time. Well, there you go. And there's, Thank you, Summer. And there's speculation that uh, uh, one of the folks running for governor uh, is instrumental in trying to push this because he views that the uh, the independents will actually be voting against him or the non-affiliated. That's speculation, but it, it's on several news cycles. By the way, uh, Summer also wrote that uh, because of her attempts to get this move to 2026, She's been called a rhino clown for two weeks. So the the level of discourse, of, even in the Republican committee, is, of course, sturdily high. And uh, yeah. we're all impressed by that. Welcome to the club, Summer. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, that, you know, that seems to be the, the M.O. of some folks. Mm-hmm. I mean, in what universe is uh, Craig Blair now a rhino after all the Oh, no, no, no. He's been moved to the liberal column, Paul. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just uh, it, it's a little perplexing. But again, it's uh, I. I Fortunately, I think a lot of folks see through some of that nonsense. And uh, again, as, as I think Craig has pointed out and others, I mean, you look at our legislative agenda that we've enacted uh, here in recent years uh, since 2015. When we go and visit with our colleagues around the state, or our Republican colleagues around, around the country, rather, uh, they are just amazed. Uh, you, you look at the, the uh, Hope Scholarship uh, that I was pleased to sponsor and work for the enactment of. Um, you know, they're just amazed that we've been able to accomplish that type of reform and other conservative reforms here in West Virginia. So, again, uh, fortunately, I and I suspect Summer has a pretty thick skin and uh, and we uh, will be just fine. I would say uh, from an opinion standpoint, I am in favor of closing the Republican primary to Republicans. I know that would offend people in the room who might be independents because you enjoy the ability to participate in a primary. But the entire purpose of a party nominating a candidate is for the party's members to nominate the candidate, not people who aren't members of the party. So I'm in favor of closing it to Republicans. Uh, However, not during the election cycle, which we are in the middle of. I think you need to set this out to the next four-year term so you don't catch people who specifically are independent but enjoy participating in the Republican primaries because there's no purpose in participating in the Democratic ones right now, like 30 years ago was the opposite. I appreciate the situation that it puts you in. We saw this in New Hampshire last night. Uh, the uh, the Republicans, uh, in large percentage, went with Donald Trump. Uh, the independents, in, or non-affiliated, uh, went with uh, Nikki Haley. Now, unlike what someone said, the Democrats did not vote. It was uh, non-affiliated or, or the Republican. Uh, but very few states have as large a number of independents as what New Hampshire did, or non-affiliated. Delegate Paul, well, again, oh, go ahead, Paul. Uh, again, uh, to be clear, you know, I think it's a, I think it is a, uh, an issue that's worthy of discussion. I, I know I've heard it discussed over the years. I think some of what I've heard from folks is that, particularly once we approach or perhaps surpass 
uh, the 50 percent range of Republican affiliation among West Virginia registered voters, then maybe, you know, it begins to be more of a, you know, a, a reasonable decision to close your primary. But when you have a significant number of registered West Virginia voters who are unaffiliated and, again, who have played a major role in um, the uh, electoral successes that we've been, that Republicans have enjoyed here. Again, I just hate to do it uh, in a hasty manner without fully thinking it through. And as you note, this late in the game, it just, uh, it just smacks of uh, just perhaps other interests being involved other than what's in the best interest of West Virginia voters. Paul, a somewhat more controversial, and we talked with Jason about this earlier, is Brandon Steele House Bill 4654, uh, which puts a fairly significant uh, jail time fine on any school, museum, or library which has uh, obscene material uh, that they had a public hearing this morning on this. Uh, have you have you had a chance to gauge your fellow colleagues? Is this going to develop legs? I uh, have not uh, had a chance to actually read that bill. It's not before a committee that I serve on. I think it's been single reference to House Judiciary, if I'm not mistaken. And Correct. Uh, you know, I, I, it's certainly a bill that's uh, beginning to start to hear a little bit more about. I did hear Senator Barrett's comments this morning and would tend to agree that it sounds like the penalties uh, that were described by Senator Barrett, uh, it sounds like those might be a little excessive. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in the committee process and so would hope that uh, our newly installed uh, House Judiciary Chair Tom Fast and our Judiciary Committee uh, will take a close look at that, uh, uh, certainly uh, take in consideration the input that was received uh, this morning in the public hearing, and uh, and hopefully, uh, if the bill does move forward, you know, make uh, – you know, uh, common sense uh, uh, revisions to the legislation in order to address, you know, any issues with the legislation. But as I think it's also been pointed out, and I think you all have noted, uh, there are lots of bills that are introduced each each year, and this one may or may not uh, ultimately move forward. It, the fact that there's a public hearing leads me to believe that it probably is going to appear on a House Judiciary agenda here soon, because uh, apparently somebody must have requested a public hearing, which is permissible under our House rules. And so before that bill can be taken up by its last committee, it, it does have to undergo that that uh, public hearing, which it did this morning. So, again, uh, just uh, we'll be watching very carefully. Uh, perhaps we'll try to listen in if my schedule permits to some of the debate if, in fact, it is taken up by the House Judiciary Committee. Well, Paul, the, uh, the penalty is notwithstanding. Uh, in my view, uh, just the concept of the bill harkens back to some of some of the more dark periods of, of our human history. So. Well, I, you know, I, I can certainly appreciate that, uh, you know, we want to ensure that there is not age inappropriate material, you know, uh, you know, in our classrooms, for example. And again, I'm not I haven't read the whole bill, so I'm not sure exactly what it states as far as museums and that type of thing. I mean, I think it's safe to say that, you know, we, we don't want, uh, you know, a depiction of. Uh, Michelangelo's David, you know, being prohibited, you know, something along those lines. But again, it's uh, I guess uh, I, I can only assume that the legislature is attempting to clarify, you know, how we uh, ensure that you know, material that is provided uh, in certain settings like schools, that it's that it is age appropriate. So, again, uh, we'll certainly uh, plan to follow that legislation a little bit closer if it begins to pick up some steam and uh, and try to, uh, um, you know, make sure that uh, issues uh, such as we've discussed are, are addressed in the legislation. So, Paul, um, moving into another area, we've asked the, the other uh, legislators this morning um, your personal, not personal favorites, but um, any bills that you've introduced that you're hoping um, will gain traction, that you um, want to, uh, to promote in this venue? Sure. I appreciate the opportunity, Maria. So uh, as I noted, uh, I was pleased to sponsor and work for the enactment of the HOPE scholarship uh, legislation uh, back, uh, I guess that's been a couple years ago. And, you know, with any legislation that we enact, it, it's not uncommon to have to go back and make, uh, you know, technical 
corrections or, or adjustments and uh, very pleased to have worked with the treasurer's uh, office uh, that um uh, you know, carries out the Hope Scholarship Program. I think they've done a wonderful job of implementing the Hope Scholarship Program. Uh, but uh, there are a few technical uh, uh, cleanup type changes that need to be made. Uh, House Bill 4945 is the legislation that I've introduced. And it, again, essentially would address some of the technical issues that the Treasurer's Office has identified uh, and um, you know, has asked that we consider addressing, uh, you know, in, in legislation. So that legislation, I did talk with uh, our uh, House Education Chair uh, this morning. Uh, he's uh, likely, he indicated that likely that bill will be taken up next week. Probably the uh, the biggest uh, change in addition to the, you know, more technical type of, uh, of issues really deals with the uh, issue of uh, of funding. Uh, right now, the uh, funding uh, that the Treasurer's Office, uh, the the uh, forecast budget for the Hope Scholarship, basically is based on the previous year's enrollment. And because the program is growing in popularity, while I, I, I do believe that it's going to continue to remain under 5%, uh, participation rate uh, that uh, was included in the initial legislation uh, because the interest and in enrollment in the Hope Scholarship Program is increasing each year. It's creating an issue with the funding in that by basing the uh, budget forecast, the budget request by the Treasurer's Office on last year's enrollment, it the the budgeted funds end up being less than what you know uh, the Treasurer's Office you know, expects uh, that uh, will be needed in order to fully fund the Hope Scholarship uh, program. The legislation that I've introduced, uh, uh, one of the key changes would allow the uh, Hope Scholarship Board to provide an estimate to the Department of Education by December 10th of each year. And the thinking is uh, by the Treasurer's Office that that will uh, help ensure that the budget request is closer to what is actually needed as opposed to almost certainly underfunding that program. The Both the House and the Senate uh, during the last uh, year or two you know, have been very supportive in making a supplemental budget appropriation to address that shortfall, but this will just ensure that the estimates are more accurate based on uh, a, a date closer to the end of the year and in, in, in the actual enrollment of the program. Paul Espinosa is our guest here on the program. He is the Speaker Pro Tem candidate for Senate. And, Paul, recently the uh, um, folks at the uh, Americans for Prosperity, I was having trouble coming up with the name there, West Virginia chapter, endorsed uh, your opponent for the Senate position for which uh, you are running. And when I inquired as to the reason for that, they simply made the comment that we're going to stick with what's working uh, Patricia Rucker is in office. We like her voting record. Craig Blair is in office. We like his voting record. And that was the reason for their endorsement. When people, uh, when organizations endorse a candidate, do they contact you and ask uh, what your thoughts are on certain things, or are they just simply going off voting records? Sometimes they do. Uh, you know, some organizations do have a uh, survey, a questionnaire that they send out. Uh, uh, organizations certainly take uh, take notice of voting records. In the case of Senator Rucker and I, uh, with regard to AFP West Virginia, uh, we both received support from Americans for Prosperity in, in past campaigns. But as you note, uh, Rob, it's not uncommon for organizations to support the incumbent when both candidates have similar voting records. In our case, again, we've, main we've both maintained near-perfect voting records on key pieces of legislation that have been monitored by AFP. In fact, I've actually championed many of AFP's uh, top initiatives. For example, uh, you, you'll recall uh, House Joint Resolution 102 that appeared on the 2022 ballot as Amendment 4 that aimed to give voters the opportunity to provide the legislature with more oversight uh, into the State Board of Education's rulemaking process. That was one of AFP's top priorities. And again, I was the lead sponsor of that resolution to put that on the ballot. Uh, also was the lead sponsor of House Bill 2007 that enacted uh, licensure reform. It, it really helped to lower 
lower the the barriers to entry for those wishing to enter the workforce, provided uh, the ability for out-of-state licensees based on training and testing requirements that were similar to West Virginia's to be able to work in West Virginia. And as we've discussed this morning, uh, work for the enactment and sponsored the Hope Scholarship Program. And I, I find it a bit ironic that AFP actually referenced Senator Rucker's support of uh, the Hope Scholarship legislation that I sponsored, uh, establishing the Hope Scholarship, and, and that worked to expand it into one of the most expansive of its kind in the nation. So, um, again, uh, I, I certainly anticipate, based on the support that I've uh, received to date, that I'll receive my share of, of endorsements. And, uh, uh, but uh, certainly appreciate that some entities will typically go with the incumbent. Uh, you know, it, even though uh, voting records are virtually identical. We have about a minute left. This is National School Choice Week. Paul, you are the former education chair. Uh, just a minute on that. Uh, I know you kind of uh, gave a prelude to that in your, in your most recent answer there, but your thoughts. Well, again, I, I've certainly been a, a strong advocate for student-centered education, uh, and I am pleased that we've been able to offer parents and students options that have been prevalent across the country. That said, uh, certainly I recognize that most of our students will continue to matriculate in the traditional uh, school setting, and so I certainly support uh, Chairman Grady, uh, Chairman Ellington, and, and their committees in trying to do all that we can to help our traditional public school setting uh, so that they can also be successful, um, you know, going forward. Paul, thanks so much for your time this morning. As always, greatly appreciated. Appreciate the opportunity. Y'all have a great day and uh, good luck with the great melt uh, that's <laughs> probably ahead with some of these more seasonal uh, temperatures. As Thank a you. person who's outside at 4 a.m., I am greatly looking forward to 60 degrees, brother. Yeah. Absolutely. Have Thank a great you, day, Paul. guys. Delegate Paul Espinosa, Speaker Pro Tem.